after the press conference, I watched and seen all the negative comments. And my goodness, you have a lot of weight on your shoulders and I commend you. And you know, I had to sit back and think about a lot of that backlash too. But these are my children. And if nobody ever speaks up for them, I have to. I have to keep them alive some way. This is for the culture. That's right. The of the fly and you know it. That's right. Hello, Newark and everybody listening in. Welcome to episode eight of season three of Razzin' 60. I'm here with my co-host, Desiree Hadley. Hey, what's going on, everyone? <laughs> Excited to be here for another episode of Rising 60. Yeah. In this episode, we will be talking about the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery Strategic Plan, which we will, which we had just unveiled in a press conference for those who those who may not have uh, known about it. Uh, we're we're going to refer to this office as the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery, or OVPTR. Our guests today are Director of the Newark Office of Violence Prevention, Lakeisha Yuri. We will also have uh, with us, uh, Al Tariq Best, uh, founder and CEO of nonprofit organization The Hub, and the founder of the nonprofit organization Through Our Voices, Sonia Rogers. Uh, in 2020, we created the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery, the first of its kind in the city of Newark. While the rest of the country shouted defund the police, the city of Newark reallocated funds from the public safety budget for violence prevention and trauma recovery. Uh, the OVP's work. Uh, to break generational cycles of violence and provide support to Newark's at-risk youth, adults, and families who have been impacted either as perpetrators or victims. Uh, You know, this office has done a tremendous job, even in its infancy. Uh, And early on in the season, we did a show called A Safer Newark, and we discussed Newark's innovative approach to public safety. Uh, We spoke with the director uh, a public safety, the police chief then, who explained how we have social workers embedded in our police department, and those social workers are from our Office of Violence Prevention. Today, we get a chance to talk about them and the strategic plan going forward, and how we are trying to make a deep impact on the safety, security, and well-being of all residents here in the city. Before we get to that, uh, let's get to some news, Desiree. Yeah, so we can uh, briefly just talk about the uh, your State of the City address. Newark, you are incredible. You are beautiful, resilient, and powerful. You come from a great history and extraordinary families. Newark, you are leading the way, and you should be damn proud of it. And I want you to remember, no matter where you walk, whether it's a suburb or a township, whether it's a village or a large city, that you stick your chest out and hold your head back and you say, I am from Newark and I am proud of it. It was your ninth address where you held it at NJPAC, as you always do. And you talked about how the city of Newark is leading the way in so many different ways, um, such as reimagining public safety, the offering of free college education to students, giving Section 8 voucher holders the opportunity to purchase their homes and pay their mortgages with those vouchers. And you are your administration has been responsible for just changing the lives of so many people. How does it feel for your legacy as mayor to be impacting people in such a positive way? Like, does it ever feel like, I don't know, like unreal to you sometimes? No. Do you ever sit back and say, wow? <laughs> like, no, I mean, actually, we, we just do it. It's not really the intent to, like, uh, I would say that Necessity is the mother of invention. So because we need these things, we create them to help ourselves and help our community. So uh, it's good that it's working and that people are looking at it. You mm-hmm. know, that's that's good. It makes us feel good about the work we're doing. It also helps us do better at what we're doing, too. Right, right. That, absolutely. All right. Uh, we, uh, As we said, we have with us Lakeisha Yuri, Director of Office of Violence Prevention Trauma Recovery. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the plan that we unveiled. Just elaborate a little bit on uh, how the plan requires treating the whole person. Like, what does that mean when you say treat the whole person? So we ultimately know that um, when our young people or adults are involved in um, any type of trauma or been victimized, that there's a root cause and something has happened um, before that incident. And so how do we help that person, but also their family, their siblings, um, the school that they're attached to, um, the friends that they're attached to? So it's the whole person, not just them themselves, but everyone around them um, and everything around them. So we are treating the whole person, the whole system, 
right? Before it happens, after it happens, and while it's happening. Okay. What, what are the, the pillars uh, or the points that you guys are trying to make here on the strategic plan? Like the key points, um, I know one of them is uh, supporting communities to have an active role uh, in public safety, that's one of them, yeah. You know, the, what, what are some of the other ones? So that first one, um, because we know that we can't have public safety without the public, so they have to have an active role, they have to have input, they have to have feedback. Um, we are mobilizing the community and organizing the community, right, to be able to do more things in the hot spots. We are ultimately um, putting more resources in the hot spots. Um, we are building trust, right, healing and resilience in the community because we know that they haven't always had trust with law enforcement. And we know that resilience is what community do. They bounce back, right? But really giving them the tools that they need and the support that they need to be able to do that and really being able to heal our communities. Mm -hmm. So this office and our office is not just about crime reduction. That's not it, right? How do we get to the root causes? How do we help the community heal? How do we um, be able to work on the lack of investment that we've had in, in our communities for so many years, right? We, we talk about the 67 rebellion to now, right, where, where our community, you know, had burned down and people left and housing was affected um, and all of those things. But what happened after that? Did we reinvest back into those things? Did the community ever really heal? Was there generational trauma? that happened and historical trauma that's happened in our communities. Um, so this isn't just about crime and violence. This is about the whole person, the whole system, the whole community, internally, externally, um, and us doing this work from a public health place in a real way. Why is that important to view it as a public health issue and not just, not just try to solve these crimes by putting more police on the streets and arresting more people? Why is it... Um, crucial to, to view violence as a, a public health issue. Because we know that that's not it. We know that law enforcement does not necessarily equal more safety, right? right? The community knows its, its, its issues, right? The people who are closest to the problem are closest to the solutions, right? And being able to get their input. So violence as a public health issue versus a public safety, which is always punitive, mm. right? Which is more incarceration, right? Which is more mass incarceration, more trauma, um, and we know that the people who go in ultimately have to come back out. But what do they come back out to? They have to come back out to a community that accepts them, that there's resources for them, that there's food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and they need to feel safe, right? And so violence as a public health issue, as the mayor talked about, right, he, he explains it, and I'll let him explain it again, from, you know, the place of when it's, it's communicable, Right when something happens, we go all the way to the root cause of where the mosquito came from, right. who they bit first, mm -hmm. all of those things. We go into the house and we want to um, track all of those things. But do we do that with, with violence? Right? Do we do that with domestic violence and sexual violence, which are the things that we continue to sweep under the rug, continue to not do anything about, and we go business as usual, thinking that it's going to go away. And so we again don't look at it as a public health issue to where there are people who have issues that are real around mental health, right? Emotional health, their social health. People are schizophrenic, depressed, overwhelmed, have anxiety, are, are really diagnosed with things, and we do not do anything about it, and we are not comfortable in our communities talking about mental health, and we don't go directly and ask people, do you need help? What do you need? We don't want to go to therapy. We don't want to do, you know, any of those things to help because it makes you weak and vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we stop people from feeling those sense of that pride and that ego? How do we get past those things to get people the real help that they need? So violence as a public health issue, because people understand when they're sick, you got to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. That's understandable. You got, you got a toothache, you go to the dentist. Right, and so they're gonna do those things and you have to frame it for them in a way that says something is wrong and we need to do something about it and go see somebody. Right. May, did you wanna, cause I know uh, Keisha re referenced your, the way you explained it yesterday, which was really good. The way you explained the violence uh, being, you compared it to how the healthcare system works. Did you wanna kinda, I don't know, explain that again for our <laughs> listeners on the podcast? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I got a thousand questions for Keisha over here. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, 
Public health is probably the best thing the country does, in my mind, does the best in terms of worldwide. You know, our ability to galvanize our resources around public health, same way we did with COVID. Um, you know, you're talking about a city that was losing seven, 800 people to uh, us getting a mortality rate below 1% in the, in the city of Newark is really a public health response. And if we could respond that way to violence and crime, uh, we we could have the same kind of results. Right. You know, we, we have a public health response. And, and, and the foundation of that is that people believe that it can actually be reduced, mm -hmm. that can actually go away. The difference here is that people don't think that about violence and crime. They think that it is always going to exist, right. that people are always going to murder each other. And some of it is racist. They believe that we just have this kind of proclivity to violence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's no infrastructure set up to treat uh, this disease, right. like it's infrastructure set up to treat polio or mumps or the measles or protocols that are in place. If meningitis breaks out in a school, right. right, there's a bunch of protocols that have to take place. That includes the public health officer in the city who has more authority, by the way, than police. Mm -hmm. The public health official in the city could isolate you, they could quarantine you, they can force you into a hospital, they can do all kinds of things. They can detain you that police can't do mm -hmm. uh, for the purposes of public health. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have that ability, um, you know, when it comes to violence and crime because it, in people's mind, it only affects us. Right. Right. So we, we, which we know is not true. So if we did that, build the infrastructure, and that's what we're trying to do, build the infrastructure mm -hmm. around public health to treat uh, crime and violence. Yeah, the same way. You know, I always say the seatbelt thing because, you know, prior to that, there were so many deaths and accidents before seatbelts mm -hmm. became. And the public health officials were the first people to say that this is, we can actually solve this problem, mm -hmm. you know. And they partner with public safety mm -hmm. to click it or ticket and all this other kind of stuff you see going around to change the culture of the way people view safety in cars and seatbelts and created laws that didn't just lock people up, right. laws that made it mandatory for you to wear your seatbelt, right. right? Made it mandatory for you to have a car seat when you come out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. All those kind of things that we can do. We can make a bunch of things legally mandatory for people who have experienced violence, mm -hmm. who get, get caught with guns. If a 15 or 16 year old boy gets caught with a gun, nobody, they're just gonna go to jail. Nobody asks why does he have a gun? Right. Where do you get the gun from? Where does he live? Yeah, where does he live? Who else got guns in his neighborhood? Yeah. I mean, what's in his mind to figure out he needs to walk around the street with a gun? And how do we mitigate that? Mm -hmm. Like, what happens to him? Is there a program he's mandated to go to because he had a gun? Like, is there some doctor he has to see or right. some protocols that's set in place? None, zero. Right. Was he, you know, maybe going to the hub could also yeah. help, right? Have yeah, something to do with his yeah. time. Maybe the court said you got to go to the hub. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the school is, you need to change the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, it change the school. I mean, that's that's a whole bunch of stuff that need to happen. But that's really what we we, we trying to get at. And uh, I know that, um, you know, yesterday you, you, we talked a little, uh, talked about a lot of stuff, actually. Um, just, I wanted to talk a little about the collaboration. Collaboration. Mm -hmm. Like, how is it, why is it important to have collaboration? Because that's key uh, in my mind. Like, why is it important to collaborate? And who exactly do you collaborate with? So the collaboration and partnership that we have, um, because the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery is ultimately the clearinghouse, but Brick City Peace Collective is the entity and the arm um, that makes sure that collaboration, partnership, and accountability happens. Um, with the organizations because for a long time we've been doing this work in silos and everyone has their own separate programs everyone is fighting for the same pots of funding everyone is i'm in this ward i'm in that ward i'm doing this i'm doing that but we did a terrible job of doing it together um, and us doing it together means that there's more resources there's more ideas there's more support we're not doing programs on the same day and being split in different directions um, and ultimately realizing that when you have collaboration and partnership and relationship with each other, then you go further together. 
Um, and so because many of us have been on the grounds for so long, we are in different organizations, but we still have relationship. So the Newark Street Academy still has relationship with the Newark Community Street Team, which are two of the mayor's initiatives, education and, and, and violence intervention and high risk intervention work. Um, but ultimately, the um, My Brother's Keeper Opportunity Youth Network, we have new people who got state funding um, in terms of next generation refile, um, new direction. Um, Equal Justice USA has been really helpful in, in bringing together this ecosystem and helping us see this work from 30,000 feet high versus everyone being at ground zero. Um, so we have several organizations, North Anti-Violence Coalition, who are working together and learning that everyone needs to stay in their lane, right? Everybody has a lane, everybody do something different, we can't do everything. Um, and being able to stay in your lane and knowing your relationship to the ecosystem is important. And so we have monthly meetings that take place and they get to report out in those meetings and then we give feedback. And so North Police Department is a part of that partnership. Hmm. Um, University Hospital, their hospital-based violence intervention program. Um, North Board of Education, right? Because that education system is important. Um, institutions, um, individuals, organizations are at the table together and understanding that we have to do it together. Um, and giving them the data and the information that they need to say, you need to be in this location, you're over here, but that's not really what's happening over there. All of the city is not experiencing that. So we don't need high risk intervention over there, we need it over here. We don't need safe passage there. We don't need all of these mentoring programs. We don't need the school base there. This is where it's really needed. And really being able to um, put the resource where they're, they're really needed. And then accountability, right? You say you do all of these things, are you really doing it? Right. Where, where's your reports? You know, let's talk about them. Um, and, you know, really working together it, out of a place of love, right? So that we can all win and move together and move the city forward. Yeah, uh, just one more, just, I know you talked about putting, doing things where people need it. And earlier you talked about hotspots. I don't think our audience really I just think, knows what yeah. hotspot is. So just explain what you're talking about mm -hmm. when you say hotspots. So hotspots are um, where we're tracking to see what's happening in those areas, where we get in the most amount of um, maybe aggravated assaults or shootings or robberies or carjackings. Um, so it's, it's where we're tracking where the most amount of crime and violence is taking place. And so we have maps that tells us where it's happening at, and we're looking to zero in even closer on the zip codes and, you know, really the neighborhoods um, a bit more versus, you know, still being all over the place. And so the hot spots, they move, right, based on if we move the, the resources into one location, then the people will move and it gets displaced. So we try to track um, the hot spots where things are happening, and we put the resources into those areas. So we're looking to um, coming up for our safe summer, you know, strategy, where it's not just the violence prevention programs, but we're putting in DPW, we're putting in workforce development, we're putting in economic and housing development, um, all of these other, you know, directors and um, departments to be able to say, hey, when we talked about the bodega strategy, right, we had all of these bodega stores where crime and violence was taking place. How do we help these business owners? How do they become safe spaces and, and safe havens for our young people because they hanging out in front of these stores? Mm -hmm. If something is happening and a fight breaks out, how do we empower the store owners to say, hey, let me help this kid. Let me call their parent. Let me keep them safe until either law enforcement come or their, or their parent come. So really empowering the neighborhoods, empowering businesses, empowering people in these hot spots to help us to do the work. Um, again, together, collaboration partnership, but really concentrating the resources in those spaces specifically. All right. With them, um, I know yesterday at the press conference you talked about, or the mayor talked about like uh, the, the, how you work, how some of the social workers are inside of like the Comstat offices, right? And they take, they listen to the calls and they, and you talked about how the police department does like the soft handoffs to the OVPTR. Um, can you give us a little more like insight how that works and how um, when certain you know, emergency calls come into the call centers, the social workers are dispatched to, to help with the situation that may be, you know, happening in certain areas of Newark or in those hot spots. So we have um, the precincts, seven precincts throughout the city, but we also have juveniles, 
Um, and we have social workers that are embedded in those locations. They report there every day, ultimately nine to five, essentially. Um, they're in the police precincts. And so we get the daily crime reports. Mm -hmm. And we're able to follow up on anything that happened the day before um, that law enforcement wants us to follow up on or if it's anything happened in the real time. Um, and so the, the desk commander or the person that's in charge will go to the social worker and they will give them the referral. Um, we have referral forms and referral sheets um, that goes directly to the social workers and they do the follow-ups. In the fifth precinct where we have arrestees, anyone who's arrested has to see the social worker um, before they are released or mm -hmm. you know, when they leave. And so we're asking the questions directly. What is it that you need? How is it that we can help you not continue to be a part of this cycle? Mm -hmm. um, what is going on? And a lot of times it's quality of life issues, right? Food, clothing, shelter, transportation, um, people panhandling, shoplifting, whatever it is. Um, and it's, it's not our heinous crimes that we think of, but we have a lot of assaults, right? We get a lot of aggravated assaults, um, a lot of simple assaults, a lot of domestic violence that's happening. Um, and our domestic violence numbers are high. Um, and really trying to put those you know, resources into place um, where we are trying to get people to help us in that area, in the sexual assault area. Um, so the social workers follow up on any um, referrals that they get from the police department. We are in Comstat every Thursday. My assistant director, Barry Ford, sits in Comstat every week and we have a place at the table to be able to report out on anything that we followed up on um, and anything that was given to us. Um, and ultimately working, you know, simultaneously to try to help um, follow up and get in front of some of the stuff. So we also strategize based on Comstat. What is the strategy to get in front of some of the stuff that we know is going to be retaliatory? We know that the retaliation may happen. We know that another incident may take place based on social media stuff that's happening, um, based on, you know, when we go back into the neighborhoods and we canvass the neighborhoods and we get and we talk to the residents and they know what's happening. Um, and so law enforcement have their intelligence, we have our intelligence, and we ultimately pull the two together to try to figure out strategies with resources, with the social workers, with the outreach workers, with the victim advocates, with the partners, right? And so it, it takes um, a lot of coordination and, and strategizing for us to be able to try to come up with some of these strategies and work together. So the social workers are in the precincts um, and we're looking to be able to expand that. That's good. Yeah. Uh, I know you, yesterday, at the press conference, you also talked about how other cities have, you both talked about how other cities have come to Newark to kind of just shadow uh, what you're doing and the work that you're doing and how Newark is basically reimagining public safety and how they view um, how they view violence and as a public health issue and everything. And can you just give us some details on like what other cities have you worked with or what other um, state officials have come? Because I know the mayor, the running joke is that how did, where did the state get there? idea for the Office of Violence <laughs> from. So, like, can you give us some, you know, just, just talk about how, what other cities have come to you or or working with you and, and, you know, trying to replicate the work that you're doing? Well, we first went to Pittsburgh, right? Okay. And we went out to Pittsburgh for a couple of days and then Pittsburgh came here mm -hmm. for a couple of days. They brought their um, police chief and their violence prevention programs and their funders and their social workers came and we were able to take them around to all of our partners to see their work um, and give them an opportunity to talk about the work um, and Office of Violence Prevention and Brick City Peace Collective. So we were able to talk to Pittsburgh and then mayor had about what 20 to other 30 cities that came here um, with their some of their violence prevention programs, but ultimately having roundtable discussions around what their cities have mm -hmm. and what we have. Um, and a lot of the cities have violence prevention or neighborhood service programs but they don't have it as extensive as, as we do. They're just getting started. They may only have two people or five people or is housed in public safety, which isn't the place that right. it should be housed mm -hmm. or that is underfunded and they're trying to figure out funding. Um, and so when they came, they were also able to hear from our partners mm -hmm. in terms of what they do and how they do it. Um, just last week, I went to the State of the Black World and they had a panel on reimagining public safety. It was like law enforcement on there and some programs. It was a huge panel. Um, and you would hear things like, we should defund the police and we don't even need police at all. And if we don't need police at all, then we don't even need mental health workers either. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> 
right? We're going a bit far, right? <laughs> and so I understood what they were trying to get at, but these they're still necessary. We just have to make sure it makes sense and how we place them and, and what their role and responsibility is in our communities. So it's not over-policing, it's not militarizing um, our communities or that sort of thing. Um, but they had cities, you know, from everywhere. And then I did a panel on um, gun violence and fratricide in the black community. Um, and I was on that panel with A.T. Mitchell from New York, um, Dr. Dorothy, she has a Mothers in Charge program um, nationally, and Pastor McBride. And then we did some roundtable conversations with people from everywhere, from Chicago, from Detroit, from um, California. And so it was good conversation, but everyone is trying to figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, while we're figuring it out, like the mayor said, we have to have some grace to make mistakes. Right, because the police are going to continue to get funded at every, at the level they're getting, and they can make mistakes. But they're looking at us; they're looking at our programs to solve violence overnight, and it's not our job to solve right. it overnight because we didn't put it here, mm -hmm. right? And so we are the ones who are trying to help um, mitigate a lot of this stuff and mediate um, and educate and you know, all of those things. Um, but we got to organize, and we have to get our messaging right. Right. And so we talked about messaging. We talked about mobilizing and having organizing skills and knowing how to change policy and get this legislation right. Um, so at the root of all of the emotional and social work that we're doing, we have to know how to organize, mobilize, um, message this work correctly um, so that we're not demeaning and undermining the work that we're doing by having our messaging not in the right place. Right. Sounds good. All right. There was one other, I want to say something else, I forgot what it was. Um, oh yeah, so just, I want to respond to what you said, it's not going to happen overnight. So I would imagine this type of work would probably take years before you see it, um, the decrease, because you got to measure it, right? You got to compare it to previous years, so it's probably going to take some time before you can see um, the the decline in violence. You think so? Or am I, make sense? Or? <laughs> Well, we, we want to see the decline in violence, but we want to see the increase of mental health, social health, mm -hmm. um, resources, people reaching out for help, right. um, a decrease in trauma, mm -hmm. right? An increase in healing, right? So we want to see those things. Mm -hmm. um, we want to have people with access to resources. We didn't have access before. Before, when we were in the streets like the mayor talks about and we were um, organizing around our demands, we wanted input into you know, public safety, we wanted the Amistad in the schools, we wanted employment for Norkers, we wanted the, the Bloods and Crips to put their guns down, and then we had public health um, as one of the things. But we didn't have access. I couldn't call the police director before and know he was going to answer the phone. I couldn't call the police chief. We couldn't get a sit down. We didn't have access. And so now we have access, mm -hmm. right? And what do you do with that access, right? The mayor says, and then you have power. And what do you do with the power, right? right? And do you know how to organize? Do you know how to make change happen? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that we're getting away from because people are no longer organizing, mobilizing, um, and have relationship enough because people are not working together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would certainly say that that's the key. Like we truly have to do this work together. We have to know what access gets us and we have to be able to change the policies and we need the sustainability plan, right? Mm -hmm. Which is next. The, the ultimate goal is to sustain this work. Whether the mayor is here, whether I'm here, how do we build the infrastructure to turn it over so that it's sustainable and it stays, stays embedded in the city's culture? Right. Like, no matter who comes in next, it'll still be here right. permanently. Right. Right. All right. I'm good. Yeah, I think. That's good stuff. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for being on with us, Kishi Yuri, Director Yuri. You're doing, guys are doing great work. All right. So, uh, we are joined with Atariq. You are the owner and, and founder of The Hub, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, within the Central Ward community serves so the city of Newark and Sonia Rogers. You also have a nonprofit as well yes. through through our voices, right? Yes. All right, so I know that both of you, um, you know the mayor very well, yes. right? Yep, mm -hmm. and uh, you you also work directly with OVPTR, and our focus today is definitely OVPTR. Mayor, did you want to open up with uh, any questions for? I uh, just wanted to you? first start with Alterique, you know, just talking about the hub, period, like what do you actually do and why is it important? Uh, how do you think it helps us reduce violence and, and deal with trauma in the city? 
I mean, um, the hub stands for help us become better. So it's all, always been about entertainment, education, and empowerment. And years ago, it was really just about prevention, right? And then we started realizing once we had the young people within our school, we started realizing that we had needed to create a, a safe haven for them, you know, on Prince Street, right? Where, where the negativity was happening and we created that. We took 9,000 square feet of dilapidated space and turned it into that safe haven. And we broke it up into those spaces, entertainment, education, and empowerment. The entertainment side was like the studio, radio, podcasting, videography, photography, graphic arts, all of those things that was going to entice the young people to come inside instead of being outside. And once we had them in there, the educational programs from financial literacy, health and wellness, grooming and self-efficacy, all of those things, right? But through that process, we started realizing that, you know, there was so much damage and trauma that was going on in their lives, we needed to figure out how we peel back the layers. and that we hired social workers to come in and help us peel back the layers. Then in the last couple of years, it became a focus on community-based violence intervention. Like, how do we do that on the next level? How do we couple ourselves with the credible messengers to be able to bring the young people that was making really bad decisions to the table so that they can see how much more what life had to offer outside of the things, the decisions that they were making. And we've been able to do that success, successfully with the ecosystem that the mayor has put together. I'm so proud of that because it felt like for so long that, you know, I, I thought I was doing things by myself, but it was a whole situation that could have been working with other people, but you don't trust people, right? You know, I grew up in a situation where it was like, I wasn't trusting people because if the kids trust me and then I send them to somebody and they don't treat them like I treat them, then then they looking at you like, you know, now they want to close back up again. So I was working in silos for a lot of years, but the mayor made us realize, like, you can't do that. We got to open up and, and you know, here's the safe haven that I'm putting together. And it made perfect sense. So I'm, I'm glad to be a part of that. And it makes perfect sense to us now. May you have any other questions? Oh, well, just, you know, uh, how do how do kids, how do residents get their folks involved uh, with the hub? Most of the you know youth that come through us are sent to us through MPD or MPS. Right. But now it's really exciting that some of the young kids that we're working with, they're bringing their friends, right? So right. word of mouth is big for us right now. Over 17 years of doing this, they, they know that we have a safe space. And you're located um, in the Central Ward. Can you Central. talk about the, where you are and how people can sign up? Do they come into the location? Do they go online? They can come in online. They can come in or they can go online, www.hublife.org. So we have a whole form that they fill out or, you know, their friends can bring them in like they've been doing lately. Okay. And how do you work with a VPTR office? I know that your organization works directly. You're one of the nonprofits in the community that works with OVPTR and Keisha Yuri's office. So can you talk about that? Definitely. The, the referrals, right? The referrals, the, the resources that's at the table, we're part of the ecosystem. I now feel like I'm, I'm partnered with people that care, right? And, you know, I've been a part of different organizations and collectives and stuff like that that didn't work, like, you know, but now I'm part of a collective that works that inspires me to do more and to open up more and to be able to share the resources that we have. But, you know, it feels good to be a part of that. OVP, the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery, Brick City Peace Collective, is, is unheard of, and we're leading the charge across America. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, so we we'll to move on to Sonya. Yeah, let's, let's Sonya. jump on to Sonya, and then we got some other stuff, you know. Uh, you know, just want to talk to you, start off with your nonprofit. Like, what is that, and why do you have it, and what do you plan on doing with it, and all of that? Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. My nonprofit is about Through Our Voices. It's called Through Our Voices. And as my children passed away, I found out that this was a calling that I had. My name is Sonia Rogers. I'm a resident of the city of Newark. Um, I'm also a mother that buried three children in this city. I stand here today with a heavy heart, but I'm going to stand here and tell my story, and I won't fall. I see people on the street and the first thing they say to me is, can I talk to you? You're so strong and this and that. And I never understood it. And so my intentions is to help people through speaking mm -hmm. because a lot of people think that I'm just a strong superwoman and I have all this superpower, but it's really just the strength that I speak. And so my nonprofit is 
and it's crazy, but it's really not based on mothers of murdered children. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a person that before my children were murdered, I lost my mother, I was molested, you know, and things of that nature. So my nonprofit is based on people losing their parents, your brothers and sisters, um, your children as well. But it's also about other things, you know, and speaking to people <clears throat> is something that I think helps. People want to talk and they want to talk about it. And sometimes people don't think that you want to listen. So through our voices is an outlet that allows you to talk not only about your children that's being murdered, mm -hmm. but about your molestation that might have happened, your domestic violence that might have happened. You know, people hurting from all different aspects. It's just so unfortunate. The new norm now is people losing their children. Okay. So. Where, do, where, do, where do you plan on doing this stuff at? In Newark? Or, or? Of course, my yeah. city. Of course, all day my city. Um, that's where I want to start. And, you know, it's all focused on my city. <clears throat> and if I can, you know, I would love to help other people. But right now, it's all about my city. You have children here that don't understand that they can talk to somebody. Right. You know, and that's just my whole goal and my whole purpose. And it's, you know, yesterday at the press conference you talked, you did to talk about what you went through, the tragic events that you experienced as a mom and, and your children being murdered. But out of that tragic um, occurrence, you know, you're creating something where you can help others, you know, and impact others in a positive way. You know, in the beginning it was hard mm -hmm. because my oldest son was in a gang, as they say, mm -hmm. you know. but. I had to realize that he still was a human being. Right. And my other children were a human being as well. You're gonna always be ridiculed. <clears throat> Yesterday, after the press conference, I watched and seen all the negative comments. And my goodness, you have a lot of weight on your shoulders and I commend you. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had to sit back and think about a lot of that backlash too. Mm -hmm. But these are my children. And if nobody ever speaks up for them, I have to. Mm -hmm. I have to keep them alive. Somewhere. Absolutely. All right. I heard you say yesterday too that uh, you know the Office of Violence Prevention didn't exist and all that other stuff. So, how do you think that could have helped you uh, during those times? Honestly, my children wouldn't have been against it because they received a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. the only things that my kids had <clears throat> back then was. Uh, a Keith Hamilton, a Brass Baraka, which was the mayor at that time. So, you know, at that point in time, <clears throat> I think that if the office was here, they could have saved them. Mm -hmm. I think so. But at the end of the day, none of these things were this city's fault. Right. You know, one community one one set of people did this. So, you know, I I had to diverse that anger, that everything, and I had to put it into one collaborative. And this is what I came up with. Right. Mm. Powerful. It's good. Thank you. And it's great that, you know, your, the legacy of your children are living on through your, the work that you're doing. When you're living in the city of Newark and you're a young black mother, I was a mother at the age of 15 and what stands for me is you get ridiculed a lot. They don't think that we have the resources and the mentality to raise these young men by ourselves. But my kids graduated out of high school. That's something that nobody will never know because they have gang attached to their name. Mm -hmm. But my last son also went to Essex County College. Wow. So, you know, I'm here. If I don't tell this story or however it's supposed to be done, nobody will never know. Mm -hmm. Nobody will never know that my son was a very respectful young man. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he'll give you the shirt off his back. Nobody ever knew that my second son was a phenomenal basketball player. So, you know, I have to, I have to. I can't drown in my sorrows right. because they're going to go deeper in. And nobody will never know. Right, right, right. right. I can't. True, so true. Tree, what's one of the things that you're happiest about, the most proud of over there at the hub in terms of the things that you guys do all the time? I know you do most of the different things, man. What's the thing that stands out to you the most that y'all provide? I think now it's it's seeing, you know, seeing that light come on with the young people, right? When, when they understand 
that you know their situations don't have to dictate dictate their destination that they can be something different and we're in the in the process of building out the very first youth focused trauma recovery center so all of this trauma that you're talking about now these young people get a chance to be able to talk about that and we're seeing that happening right now with them opening up and talking about those things and being able to have different modalities to help them do that, you know, because every child, every individual heals in a different way. Success right. means different things to different people. Right. So that's what makes me happy about seeing that change, that light come on. Right. That's good stuff. And then I, you impacted Amira. Amira, who's a camera right, you operator know. for the city, she was a part of your um, program as right. well. Absolutely. Which is, you can see directly how you've impacted folks every you, day. You know, <clears throat> As adults, we need trauma therapy. Mm -hmm. But in the household, you also have a child that's there that endured that trauma. Mm -hmm. They need help too. You know, us as adults, we lose our children, lose our parents, things of that nature. But these children lose their uncles, mm -hmm. aunts, grandmothers and stuff. Cousins that they were so, that's my favorite cousin, that's my favorite aunt. They're hurting, but they're too tough or too something just to break that narrative like I can't speak I can't talk like that you know I can't shed a tear I'm too tough for this you know very true yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. true so I'm I mean I, I could talk all day but <laughs> we gotta you know close it out but um Mary did you have anything else you want to say about no just give you guys the last opportunity to say a word if you want to say something before we move on we bring Keisha and them in here just the last opportunity to say anything you want to say to the listeners out there I'm just here to help, and I'm ready to get healed. Everybody needs help, and it's time for healing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not gonna happen overnight. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen overnight. I never thought I would be at this point, and I appreciate you, and I thank you, you know. I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for, you know, creating a system that, you know, builds resources for us to be able to grow, right? And, you know, I hear people say all the time, hurt people, hurt people, but I never let people stay right there, right? Mm -hmm. Hurt people, hurt people, but heal people and healing people can heal people. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's what this is about. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I'm gonna take that one from you, out, Tariq. Appreciate <laughs> you, man. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank, thank both of y'all for getting on with us today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say thank you to our guests, Sonya Rogers, Al Tariq Best, yeah. uh, Keisha, Director Keisha Yuri. Uh, we are doing some very great work in Newark in a very deep and cultural way, changing the way we view violence and trying to see it as a public health issue. We're treating it as public health as well and by paying attention to all the details, how, where, and who it happens to and why it happens. And we are treating the root causes and conditions of violence and not just the outbreaks. Uh, and a no amount of rest are going to produce a sustainable uh, and safe city. Uh, and police officers know that we cannot arrest our way out of these issues, that we need a holistic approach. And that's what we're trying to get at here in the city of Newark by examining the situation scientifically. How do we approach it uh, from every angle, comprehensively and holistically? Uh, and we're, we're doing that and we know we have a long journey ahead of us, but we've done some incredible things thus far. So just want to thank again all of the folks that jumped on with us. Keisha Yuri, Al Tariq Best, Sonia Rogers. Thank you, of course, Desiree and all of the people that are tuning in and listening to us uh, now and in all of our episodes. So make sure you share this episode of Razzin 60 with your family, friends and social circle. Stay updated on the many, many, many exciting initiatives that are transforming our city. Uh, and remember, an eye for an eye will only make the whole world blind. Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs>